Hey everybody, we are so excited to be bringing you another season of the Center for Sport and Social Justice's Making Moves podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Bonchasumi. Alongside student rep, Maddie Acosta, we're gonna be bringing you some amazing conversations in the upcoming week, so stay tuned. Hello everyone, this is your student co-host, Maddie Acosta, and I'm your CSSJ student rep and a senior here at CSU East Bay. I'll be graduating this May with a BA in kinesiology. One of our great keystones of curriculum for kinesiology here at East Bay is social justice in sport and health professions. I have been taught the complexities, realities, and ways to address social justice in the field of kinesiology while being a student here. And I'm so excited to be a part of making moves and this social justice movement. We have amazing guests with us to talk about soccer in Oakland, specifically pro women's soccer. To help us get the inside scoop, we have our new host, Lisa Bontasumi. Lisa is a licensed clinical social worker and practicing psychotherapist with over 20 years of clinical experience. She also brings her education and training as a mental performance consultant to her work with athletes, coaches, and teams. Lisa is the first ever mental performance coach at the Oakland Roots Soccer Club. As a response to need, Lisa built Athlete Mindset, a diverse team of athlete-centered clinicians and practitioners that spans over several states and into Mexico. Lisa is the host of the Athlete Mindset podcast, a TEDx speaker, presenter, and a published author. She's also an advisory board member for the Center for Sport and Social Justice. Along with our amazing hosts, we also have two amazing special guests. They're actively growing the women's game while making an impact in the community. A warm welcome and special thanks to our guests, Mike Geddes and Jessica Clinton. Mike Geddes is the co-founder and chief purpose officer at Oakland Roots and Soul Soccer Club, an advisory board member for the Center of, for Sport and Social Justice. Mike has a journalism background and was a former soccer reporter for the BBC Network. Mike also has spent many years working in the nonprofit space in Germany, South Africa, and the United States. Mike has since settled in the Bay Area where his connections led to the formation of Oakland Roots and Seoul Soccer Club. As the first and only Chief Purpose Officer in American Pro Sports, he is truly uniting the city through sport. We also have with us Jessica Clinton. She is the first ever head coach for the women's free professional team, Oakland Seoul Soccer Club. She is also the assistant coach for the women's soccer team here at CSU East Bay. So excited to have you here, Jessica, from East Bay. Jessica has more than 15 years of experience as a Division I college coach, including serving as the head coach at Fordham University for seven years. Jessica was also the associate head coach at Boston University and assistant coach at St. John's University. Jessica also has extensive experience coaching at the youth level, having served as a director of coaching at South Shore Select Girls Academy program. So excited to have everybody here. Now let me turn it over to our incredible host, Lisa. Thanks, Maddie. Dang, talking about my people here, Jess and Mike. That was an excellent job. You're doing a great job co-hosting. I appreciate all that you do for us. So I appreciate you very, very much. Let's get it going. Let's dive right in. Jess, we're going to start with you. What does social justice in women's pro soccer mean to you? It's a lot, right? Yeah. I think social justice can look at different elements to the women's game. So we talk about equality within uh -huh. the space uh -huh. of not just from an equal pay standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, from an expectation and a standard standpoint. We know the women's game is very different than the men in the space that we hold uh -huh. and what our supporter group look like. So a social justice component is also a mental health component that comes uh -huh. along with it. Uh -huh. It is also a diversity component to what we have, right? So I think it carries a lot, social justice being a very big category. Yes. And how we carry that space from a mental health, from an equality standpoint, from a diversity standpoint. And I'm sure Mike can add to this too. It just is a matter of what our space actually is and allows. How do we work within that space? And also how do we grow that space knowing that we are very different than the men's game. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I know part of our narrative as the Oakland Roots is that we were wanting to, and Mike can speak to it too, is build a women's team first and then it shifted. But I'll let Mike tell it. And with that, maybe expound on the mission and core values that guide 
the Oakland Roots and Soul. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, just to pick up on that point of it was a women's team and it shifted. So what Lisa's yeah. referring to there is when we had the idea of building a purpose-driven professional sports team, we just naturally kind of gravitated towards the women's game because uh-huh. the concept of purpose as a driver of performance and profit and not as a counterweight to that, we just felt the women were already there. You know, look at what WNBA athletes have been doing for years. Look at what uh-huh. people like Megan Pino have been doing for years. So we just felt that it was the women's sports space was more ready for what we were trying to do. But at the time, this is going back six, seven years, there just wasn't the same depth of opportunity on the professional side in the women's game to start something and grow it. You Uh had NWSL and that's it. And getting into that very small kind of community, especially with having no money (laughs) and, you know, just having an idea was difficult. So we saw an opportunity to start on the men's side, but for sure, from day one, from the very first moment we mentioned this in Oakland, you better believe people were saying, okay, but what about women? Okay, but what about Right, women? right. And so what we were trying to do was build a purpose-driven pro sports organization. And we knew that that mission was and will not be complete until we had men and women in an equitable position. Uh-huh. So for us, the men's side was a means to an end. It was a means to get started, prove we could do it, prove uh-huh. there was a demand, and then ultimately realize our full ambition, which is men's and women's professional soccer with a robust academy and player development system, all built around the same concept of being purpose-driven. And for us, that purpose is to harness the magic of Oakland and the power of sport as a force for social good. And that means for us, and Jessica alluded to it, not just thinking about how do we kind of use our position to advocate for change, to donate to causes, but also Uh how do we look at the system in which we exist, which is a system which does harm and has done harm over the years, and say, what are we doing to change that, both internally within how we build the organization, but also how we operate within, within our leagues. And that is a process which is long, and we are still at the start of that journey, but we are delighted to be able to kind of now step into the, the women's game and very, very fortunate to be working with someone like Jessica in, in pursuit of that goal. Yes, of course. Thank you for that. I know that I know it means a lot to me as a woman to see our Oakland soul be headed up by Jessica, a woman. You know, we know there are dynamics that exist in youth, collegiate, and pro soccer where it's men coaching women and there's power dynamics, all kinds of different things that go on there. For you, Jess, what does it mean to be the head coach of the Oakland Soul to you? What does that mean? It means a lot, right? It means everything. I think going through the process of interviewing with Soul and Roots, I was able to gather a lot more information than just what I saw from a social media post, right? I got to know the culture and in, in, in Mike's passion and what Mike just shared in the social driven portion and harnessing the magic of Oakland, I bought into it, Mm -hmm. right, immediately. And so every time I spoke to someone in the organization, that passion was evident in everyone. And I think that was really part of what ignited my excitement for it and how, even from a football standpoint, how even from a technical side, the driving of the force of women's football and the thought process behind how there's a change in it. You're seeing the change even on the men's and the boys side in what they're doing in the organization. Uh So to see that and be a part of that and not replicate it, but have that as a guiding component to what can help soul be successful was really a part of it. And on top of that, being in Oakland, getting to know the players, getting to know the landscape and being able to work with some of the top players from the area and honestly, um, a very diverse group of players from socioeconomic backgrounds, from racial backgrounds, from everything, that roster was built with locality in mind. So that was a big portion where the spaces I have been in before, it has not been as evident or has not been a driver. And so this was a big part of me being able to join and have almost access to being able to be around players like that and share experiences. 
No, I love that. You're already answering a question that I had on my queue here. Like, <laughs> thanks for jumping ahead. No, you're good. <laughs> that saves me time. There we go. Because for us to know how the players reflect our community of Oakland specifically and the Bay more broadly is really, really important. And for you being a woman coaching women, what is that like for you? I know that's something you do day in and day out, but I think the dynamic between a woman coaching a woman, a, a coach who you've coached from youth, collegiate, and now pre-professional, like, what does it mean for you to be there and to be who you are and to like know that these young ladies are looking up to you? Yeah, it's weird because, I, you know, I had a couple of female coaches growing up and then, but my first full-time, I guess, female coach that I worked with was in the college space. And it was, it was different for me who had played mostly for men as a youth uh -huh. player. Uh -huh. But honestly, within Seoul, I think that's a great question to ask the players because okay. I also have male staff members who are yes. also wonderful in that space. But there are some conversations that maybe in my age and experience too, now that I'm way older than being a 25-year-old assistant, I've also grown in that aspect. So I wouldn't just put it as me being a woman, but me also being an experienced coach in that space of managing players or just talking with humans, understanding the importance of things. So I also have worked with or played for great men as well, but the experience is different. Yes. Right? So we might be talking about things like with some of my current soul players, very specific to shared experiences as being a female, right? That my men or my male assistant coaches have not had that experience, but they have a very different experience as they are also, they are Latin and Hispanic descent. So like, that's a totally different experience that I cannot relate to, but they can share that experience with my players. So I think that there is a growth to that piece, but that's, it's a fun part to being able to create relationships. There will always be a power dynamic, being a female coach or a male coach. It's just, how are you, I think, relating or helping grow, develop players, which then creates that relationship? For sure. For sure. I think it's important for you to break that down for people to hear, because as a parent to a youth athlete and a former player myself, that just because you're a woman coaching a woman doesn't mean that that's the end all be all. And then that's going to be great and vice versa, that we need men, allies to help move the game on the pitch and like with people like Mike. So behind the scenes and growing in that aspect. So I think that's important to differentiate and have your words with that. I will ask the players later, but I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Yeah. Mike, what are some of the societal and economic barriers that you've experienced in starting and growing the soul? I mean, economic barriers are probably kind of just connected to the challenges of starting any professional sports enterprise like it costs money and yeah. like a lot of enterprises you know we currently do not have stadium because there are no stadia in oakland that meet the standards for professional soccer right so that means that until we have that like we're not economically profitable which is you know not uncommon but it means that we have to find investment to get us to the point where we can build our own stadium and you know we're deep in the process of doing that right now but having uh -huh. a stadium is critical to our goal of having the first professional sports team in Oakland for women ever so that means that we have to constantly raise money that's a challenge but it's a challenge that we're well used to would it be easier if we had a billionaire or a private equity firm yes but but we don't mm -hmm. so we have to do it in the way that we've always done it which is through a building a diverse investor group and, you know, involving the community like we did with our community investment round. But, you know, I wouldn't say that's kind of unusual to the women. And I think you could even say that actually having a women's team makes it easier given the current growth in women's sport and the fact that people are finally waking up to what a fantastic investment opportunity it is. So actually, I don't see that as a barrier. Mm -hmm. I think actually that's going to help us. Societal, again, I think in the last year, we've seen a big shift in people's understanding finally of the possibility and potential of women's sports uh -huh. and you know there is ample data out there to show how fast it's growing 
And I think, again, the barriers traditionally have been that it's a space controlled mainly by men and men control most of the capital. And they did not historically see women's sport as worthy of investment or they invested as a subset of a men's product. And I do believe that's changing now. And I think it just takes people to realize, oh, here's a chance to make a ton of money and then suddenly everything shifts, right? It doesn't mean that suddenly we have much more greater representation in terms of who owns the capital, like that is still male dominated, but they are realizing, oh, this is a big growth opportunity now. So actually for us, I don't feel like we've had much, the only pressures that we've had unique to the women's side is the fact that is trying to do it all at once, right? Trying to start a professional entity Uh Uh with a men's team and then also trying to start a women's team on top of also creating the academy structure, you know, we could easily have not made the decision to launch Oakland Soul last year because you could have very easily made the case that, oh my gosh, you guys are so new and you're in such a challenging environment given that you don't have any professional stadia. Just wait, you know, just wait until you can launch a professional team. You know, why launch a women's team until it can be completely equitable with the men's? Just wait until you have a stadium. And that would have been a very defendable position. I think for us, it was so important to just make it real and like right. allow people to see it and right. live. And I think that's where the USL deserves a tremendous amount of credit in that they have invested in creating opportunities at different levels for people to make these things a reality. And I think that that's a good thing because prior to this, it was, you know, whatever, 14 NWSL markets and that's it if you wanted to have like a professional robust structure like that's crazy there's so much demand out there and i think that having the uslw gave us the chance to say okay we believe so strongly in this that we want to make it real we want to invest we want to make this look and feel like a professional and like extremely high level product from the jump even if it's going to take us until we can get a stadium to make it equitable on a completely financial level, because uh-huh. ha- people have to see the possibility. We, we need girls to see what an Oakland team looks like. And so we made the commitment to do that, which was not a small commitment because we are a very, very small organization and very young and battling a lot of headwinds just to make professional sport work in Oakland, period. But we, uh-huh. it was so important to us to make it real. And we're so glad and proud that we did that because the Uh response we had last year was incredible and Uh it's actually helped us to then say look people want this like there is demand for this it is jessica alluded to it it's a different type of product it's not just a that we're just translating a thousand fans from the roots to the soul it's it's different fans it's a different type of game and that was important for us to do it it wasn't easy and, and not to say it wasn't without its challenges but that was kind of the biggest challenge to us was just can we actually pull this off and make it meaningful everything else i think has been a very natural process for us like the demand has always been there the opportunities i think are going to be even greater on the women's side because of the growth of the game and the ceiling being Uh so high Uh yeah that's what i would say have been the, the major challenge no that's great thanks for breaking that down for us i think it's important and really valuable for people who are listening to hear the background of it and like the thinking that has gone into it So Jess, for you, if you could, for those of us who aren't fully informed, can you break down the difference between pre-professional team and a fully professional team in the women's game right now? Mm -hmm. So the USLW is considered pre-professional, which means that the players cannot be paid a salary. Okay. Players are able to get, from an NCAA standpoint, basic needs. So food if you're traveling to a game, right? Training gear as necessary. So that's considered pre-professional because it fits under the NCAA compliance legislature. Nice. And that's where Seoul sits right now. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And within that model, you can have players, you can have youth players, you can have college players, former pros, Uh over 23 players that are not currently being paid from a soccer or football job or playing, I should say. And so that allows everybody to be able to play. Gotcha. Right? Gotcha. Lisa, yep. if you wanted to play, you could play in the <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah, okay. Thanks well, you for could. that. Yeah, technically, <laughs> I mean, technically, technically, you could. I could. 
physically yeah. and mentally is something different, but yeah. Totally. <laughs> right. And then from the professional group, there are different like front office standards and stadium standards okay. too when you transition mm-hmm. from the W League to the Super League. So that becomes Super League has Division One sanctioning, which equals to what the NWSL has. Gotcha. And then players are paid, right? That's the big thing. So currently, the players on the Soul have full-time jobs elsewhere. Some of them do, yes. Yes. And they have to travel to training and for games and show up. And I don't think people realize that fully. No, it's so funny because, like, some people at games think that we have professionals. So when I mention we have a player on our team who is an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so... She works during the day and sometimes her engineer labs go over in time, but we train at night to accommodate the individuals who work during the day so they can leave work and come straight to training. Or we have youth players that are with us that have to go through school yeah, and then they come and play with us. So there is a component where that's what we have. Now, you can still be a professional soccer player and have a job, like both are allowed in that space too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We see Paris FC does it for their players. They have training in the evening so that their players can have jobs or go to school should they choose. Yes. But it's not one or the other. However, Mm -hmm, as a mm -hmm. professional player, I am receiving a salary to play football. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for breaking that down. I think people, yeah, including myself on some levels, and I work right in the game, the, the nuances of where the players come from, what they have to do, their lives and their humanity and who they are as people outside of the sport is really important. And you just, you know, I appreciate it, like including mental health as part of your social justice understanding approach to coaching, to the soul and all the levels that it can be and will be here in Oakland is really, really important. You both spoke about community involvement. I think the community, as you know, is so wanting to support, wanting to be a part of something special. The community round of investment was really huge and groundbreaking and rule-breaking. It was really, really fantastic to be a part of. What are some other tangible ways that the community can support the growing success of the soul through the seasons, through the years? I'll start with Mike on that one. Yeah, I mean, very tangibly. When is this podcast going? <laughs> In about a week or two? Are you about okay. to tell them to come um, to a certain game or something like? <laughs> no, I mean, look, coming to games and showing that women's soccer has a following is obviously great. You know, we have a, a double header coming up on June the 8th with the Roots, which means we play at a larger venue, which is Cal State East Bay's wonderful. Oh, we will Stadium. make sure that this is out before then, Mike. We'll, June right. 8th, so that, we have time. We have time to get yeah. it out. Yes. So that would be a great one. But, sure. but of course, coming to games, you know, repping the merch, telling people about it. Word of mouth is the best marketing, but also kind of we're also in a process of trying to convince the city of Oakland and the Alameda County Board of Supervisors to help us bring the team to a fully professional level, which means Uh getting a stadium. So at various stages, we are asking for support in making that case to the county because we believe that Oakland deserves pro sports on both the men's and women's side. So periodically, we do ask people to help with that. And you can usually find that information on our website and through our mailing lists. But I would say just, you know, follow us on socials, Sign up for the newsletter, come to games, rock the merch, tell people about it, and speak to your elected officials and kind of advocate for that Oakland deserves pro women's sports. Those are all things that people can do to really help us out. And, you know, if and when we do another community investment round, become an owner. Yes, yes. No, those are really good, tangible ways and acts of social justice to be able to feel like the community and our fans can be a part of what we're growing, not just when we have the community rounds and we'll have more, but like on a day-to-day. You could email or call your local elected official every day if you wanted to and say what you want, say what you need, say what you want to see. And so people want to know what they can do. And, and of course, the swag, the merch, the attending the games, June 8th is all really, really important. If we go back to sort of the beginning, like women players 
at high levels start as girls in the youth system. Jess, when you think about it, as you reflect on your own career or like the landscape that it is now, what would you want coaches of youth girl teams to prioritize in their coaching philosophy from a social justice standpoint and equity standpoint? What would you like them to focus on if you had a magic wand that you could wave? <laughs> there's there's a lot, actually. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm funny. asking you lots of questions, yeah. but there's a lot, huh? <laughs> I know. Well, because I've, I've thought about these before. I've been in these settings where, okay. you know, when I was a college, or I am a college coach, when I sit on sidelines and I'm watching players to recruit them. Yep. Right from a college system. Some of the things that coaches say to the players, you just sit there, close your eyes and swallow it. Some of the things that are said to players are unnecessary or cruel, to be fair. And that's a really hard thing. So you sit there and say, okay, well, how do you actually prioritize what coaching is? Like from an information standpoint, what mental health is within just in general coaching, Uh right? How can you manage or get the best out of players in certain situations? And how do you understand what a 13-year-old girl is going through if you've never been through it before? Or you have, and how do you just create understanding or space for that individual to to learn and grow? That's one side of it. Uh The other side from a youth player perspective is, or a coach in that space is, how do we educate parents? So from when I played, Uh right, we were playing because we loved it. I think... At my oldest age of U18, we paid $250 to be a part of a right. team. Right. And that was the salary of the coach, the uniform, and maybe a permit for a field. Right. I understand that permits for fields can range from $250 an hour to $1,000 an hour. So that certainly has changed. Coaches' salaries have changed. Right. So it has become a business. And I think sometimes we as adults, whether we are coaches or whether we are parents, forget that the game should be fun. Right. So players are now pushed through the youth model system to have a college scholarship. And when players make it to the college level, they don't actually love the game. Uh Because the game is totally different, right? The sport in playing with a ball on the field and the amount of players is the same, but how you go from the youth model system to the college system couldn't be any more different. And there's no bridge that helps players. I think that's a really important space. As a coach, it's understanding what that space needs. I mean, how many times are you seeing players hit the transfer portal because of mental health? But mental health for individuals is very different. Right. Right. It could be from an academic standpoint, this no longer fits. Uh Uh-huh what I want academically. So for my own mental health or my future, right. And how we use that word mental health, right. Right. Is also very different to be fair. I don't think I ever used it as a youth player now as an adult, it's in a lot of conversations. So how is it from a mental health standpoint for my academic or from my social, I chose a party school. I'm actually not a partier. Mm -hmm. for my own mental health, I need to get out of here, right? So Mm -hmm. I think we use it in different spaces, but you see the portal being so popular and even that college space has become professional athletics in a way. Mm -hmm. With NIL and everything else. Yeah, Yeah. and we just forget that the game is fun. So like, I think you see the pro players who are individuals who just love the game and want to spend time around the ball. Like, I think that's a portion of why they make it so far Uh is that they just figure out what they actually love about the game. I'm sure there still is mental health or we know there's mental health and, you know, trauma and great things and like all these things that fit under same and shared experiences. But what keeps them going is their love for the game and the passion for the game. And so you see burnout from a youth girl perspective. Right. And so that, I think, is also what we try and manage within our system at Seoul is some of our players have certainly had some bad experiences. And going from year one to year two, it's a matter of like, how do we actually have them enjoy their experience 
teach them along the way, even if they're a former professional player, right? Teach them still along the way because there probably is a fun element to that too. Right. And then playing in front of the crowds that have been set up by the front office, creating that professional environment and that sellout crowd and being a part of entertainment and something that goes with Oakland, I think is a really important piece and step process in repairing some of their mental health moments that Mm -hmm. maybe were bad moments in college or the youth realm. So we try and make it a safe and cathartic space for them. Because we know going back to the youth stages or even the college stages is it's a very different system and it's a hard space to navigate and it's not a perfect system either. So as coaches, if we can educate ourselves and put ourselves in the best position to just help, help and be a part of their journey and not give them too big of a bump in their journey, whether it's positive or negative, if we're just Mm -hmm, there to mm -hmm. help within their journey, then I think we're in a good place. I agree. Thank you for all of that. So, so important. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not shy about this. There's no other club that I would affiliate myself with in the way that I do because of the value for purpose, the value for social justice, the value for mental health within the club. And so that was a huge and is a huge stance to take you know, that we have an integrated mental health expert to help out on the performance side and life side. I think, like you said, mental health is used in different ways by different people for different reasons. I think what you're highlighting is that academics and the struggles that academics and balancing life, school, well, academics are school, the actual work and being in school and sports can have an impact on your mental health. And that yeah, this is a party school. I realize I'm not that. And actually my social support is diminishing has an impact on someone's overall well-being entirely. And so I think you being able to speak to that here with us is really important. As we speak about it, the stigma of it decreases and becomes more normal. And that's exactly what we want. And this is an opportunity for education, which is also really, really important. That mental health does not mean mental illness. It's different. We all have mental health. All of us, just like we have physical health, but we all exist on a continuum of how healthy we are and how we respond to those mental injuries, those physical injuries are one and the same. And the mind and body are connected. And so, again, this is my little piece about the pride that I have in being a part of the Oakland Roots, Oakland Soul Sports Club. and being able to interact with you guys on this level and not in the usual ways that we do, but like being able to bring to light the message of who we are and what we stand for. So I really appreciate you guys spending the time. I'll give you each the mic one more time. Like what else would you like to say about women's pro sports in Oakland? Either one can go. Jess is pointing well, at Mike. Y'all didn't see yeah. that, but just point at Mike. <laughs> I'll go because I think it's appropriate for Jessica to have the last word. I think equity that, in action, uh, people. Equity in action. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that there is so much potential here. The mm-hmm. talent in the Bay Area is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And I strongly believe that we are scratching the surface because there are so many girls who could be potentially great soccer players that don't get the opportunity because of the inequities in how our system is built. Yep. And that's a great example of how purpose for us is a driver of success in our business. You know, in this industry, I mean, in our society in general, but particularly in this industry, the assumption is that if you consider purpose, you are compromising performance or profit. Right. So if you care about doing the right thing, you don't care as much about winning or about making money. And that is the default setting for A, our society, but also our sport. And we do not believe that's the case. It's why we're very grateful to have someone like Jessica in her position who can embrace that and hold that and understand that it's not that we don't want to win. We want to win desperately. Oakland deserves championship teams. It's just that we believe the way to get there is by taking a different approach. Uh And a great example of that is 
the number of girls who cannot afford to pay to play soccer. So they might experience it like when they get into middle school and suddenly they're at a school that has a soccer team. Oh, great. I want to try out, but I'm playing against girls who've been playing at pay to play clubs since they were seven, eight, and I'm getting blown out 10, 15 mil and I'm dropping out of the game. That's a huge waste. And so what we want to do is change that, create a pipeline, do what we can to support more equity and access to the game of soccer to make it more welcoming, to remove the barriers to participation, whether it's financial, cultural, or geographic. And that starts at every level. It's a huge task, but it's a task that we're very interested in taking on. And yes, it starts at, in terms of us asking, how do we facilitate access at the grassroots level and get more girls into the game full stop, especially right. from communities who have traditionally not engaged with soccer because they don't feel like it's for them, they don't feel welcome, whatever. But also it means having a team on the field that create possibility models for those girls to see uh -huh. and say, oh, that could be me, you know, uh -huh. and, and that means having, you know, an excellent team in place that people want to go out and watch. So when we've seen that just in one short season, the difference in just having a team that is real is massive. Like the difference uh -huh. for these girls in having a team to look at, players to meet, heroes to worship, like it makes a big difference. And for us, we believe that doing the right thing, i.e. making the game more accessible. It's not just what we should be doing for kind of moral reasons. It's actually our key to success because one huge advantage we have here in the Bay Area is talent. Uh -huh. like there is so much athletic talent out there and that talent can lead you to a professional career, but it could also lead you to a college career. It could lead you to just kind of better mental and physical health outcomes. And our girls deserve that. Yes. And that's why we believe so strongly that Oakland and the Bay Area deserves to have its own soccer team. So, um, you know, I talked earlier about how people can help us get there, but support your local teams because it's for the, the greater good of, of women and girls in our area, you know, not just now, but for generations into the future. Thanks, Mike. I can't appreciate that enough. Thank you. Jess. I don't know actually how I follow up with that. I don't <laughs> But, you know, I make the case for women's football and people understanding, right, the pay to play model is a very difficult situation to navigate when you are choosing to leave out a group of individuals who can and should be playing. It becomes a really tough situation, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand like some clubs offer scholarships and things like that. Even I've learned during that process, you know, going through that financial assistance or scholarship process is another barrier towards receiving that scholarship. Asking a right. family to fill something out that maybe English isn't their first language is a barrier to asking for it. So I've learned so much about inclusion and, you know, movement of social justice, just being a part of the Roots and Soul mm -hmm. organization, which is pretty cool. I wish the pay to play model wouldn't exist. I don't mind paying for football at the youth stage, uh -huh. right? But to pay $5,000 to be a part of a team and then add $10,000 for travel becomes really difficult amongst families. And quite honestly, me and my friends have always discussed how would we be able, like, could our parents afford that? How would we be right. the players that we were? We always think that we are professionals, but would we be that good or ever make it that far if we were in a system now? And that's a really hard thing to navigate. But it, at some point, as Mike said, women's football is a business, right? Mm -hmm. Like from a professional standpoint, it is a professional sports team. And with many professional sports teams here in the U.S., it is a successful model. As a woman in sports, I do not want women's football to be a charity. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's a really important piece. So don't give me something because it's a charity, mm -hmm. right? There is a component to a business side and the players, even the players that we are able to sign and roster for games, understand being a part of Seoul is a really important thing for Oakland, right? And when we step on the field, who are we representing and why is that important? And they understand that they are part of a business or they learn that portion of it. And there's an entertainment value that comes along with it. Uh -huh. They may not be paid in the situation, but their access to different things can come from it. So I want people to start to think 
that women's football is not a charity. However, we need to grow and push the game as our business model continues. We just saw it from the college realm, right? Mm -hmm. Of the final four of women's basketball. And it's a wonderful thing to see. It has taken years upon years to get there. But now that it's there, we cannot take a step back. And I think that's a really important piece to how we continue to grow women's football is that there is an understanding at the next level that we can push women's football, we can push women's sports, but we want to be taken seriously in having equal access to the support that's given to the men if the expectation is the same. Mm -hmm. If you expect us to win, and this is why I love being a part of, again, Roots and Soul, if you expect us to win, then give us the support. Mm -hmm. And so if that's not the case, then our expectation and standard may have to be different. So we can grow the youth game and there's a model for having fun and development. Once we start getting to the next level, we are a very strong business model and we want to be taken very seriously when it comes to that. Yes. Well, you followed Mike very well and like led on your own. So that was fantastic. <laughs> I think that's an important. Women's soccer is not a charity. What? That's a hashtag right now. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so happy to have had this conversation to be a part of it with you all and for people to hear it and listen to it. So I thank you again, Maddie. I'll have you close us out. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa, Mike, and Jessica. We appreciate you all taking the time to join us and share your expertise with us here today on the Making Moves podcast. We'll link the references in the show notes for those who want to follow up on the Oakland Roots and Soul Soccer Club. Funding for the Making Moves was provided by Cal State University East Bay and the Center for Sport and Social Justice. Make sure to catch all past and future episodes of Making Moves streaming now on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Thanks again, everyone. We really appreciate you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much.